Are you looking for a career transition? To find that thing that you absolutely love and to make money doing it? And everybody's like, oh, wow, you get to do all this stuff. And it's like, yes, I do. And, and it's, it's awesome. But careful. Maybe it's not so glamorous. But it's not the same if you're out there for some soul time in the mountains, as I like to call it. Like if I get to go out without a camera, that, that almost never happens anymore. I think a lot of people that have made their passions into their career will say that it's awesome, but also be aware that all of a sudden your passion is your career. All of that in some quick and dirty ways to get more likes on your Instagram photos, because that's important too. Welcome to Mountain Meister. Who are the Mountain Meisters? Committing to the goal and galvanizing you and your team behind that one single focus. Being at peace with that fear and being okay with it. You gain a real appreciation for your life and for what you have. Learn about their extreme lives on rock, snow, and ice with your host, Ben Shank. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Mountain Meister. This is Ben speaking, your host. And today with me, I have Frederick Marmsader. Did I say that correctly, Fred? That's correct. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So Frederick Marmsader, what nationality? I'm guessing something Scandinavian? That's correct. I'm Swedish, actually. I was born and raised in Stockholm um, and then moved to the States when I was in the middle of high school. Oh, well, you don't have any accent, I don't believe. It creeps in every now and then, but yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll listen for it. For the listeners who don't know Fred, he's a professional adventurer, photographer, and videographer doing work for just about every major outdoors publication, most recently with magazine covers on Alpinist and Backcountry. Fred, welcome, and congratulations on being named a Mountain Meister. I should always say that. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. So I've actually been extraordinarily excited uh, to talk with you because there's a lot that I need to learn uh, from you. And we had one other uh, professional photographer on the show, Chris Noble, in episode number 47. I was able to learn a little bit from Chris, and now I'm going to learn even more from you. Uh, and I think that's something that the listeners can probably take home too. Uh, so I guess to get started, let me let me just give you a quick story about my competency as a photographer, or lack thereof, I should say. So there was this time I was sitting in the bar with some friends, and this group of girls approaches me. Um, it was one of her birthdays, or maybe a bachelorette party, I forget, but they asked me to take a picture of them, and so I took the iPhone that she was handing me, and they all lined up. I took the photo, which I thought was fine, showed her the photo, and she looked at me, she looked at the photo, said thank you very much, and then walked to a different person, I'm not even kidding, five feet away from me, and said, hey, would you mind taking a photo of us? I honestly, I, I don't know what I did wrong. That's the worst part of it. Uh, so I'd love if you could give me some feedback, give our listeners some advice about what makes a good photo. Let's say, let's say we're taking a photo of a group of girls. Where do I even cut off the bottom of the photo? Well, that's a tough question, <laughs> of course. Um, yeah, I think you probably cut off. That depends on how wide they are in your frame, but I would say you probably get closer than you think and fill the if you're taking pictures of of people that want basically a portrait style or a group photo, you'd want the people to fill most of the frame and not have a bunch of dead space above people's heads or, or, you know, so that you can see people's faces and you can see their expressions and you can see their eyes so that there's a connection with the people in the, in the photograph. So I'd say you'd probably want to stand closer than you might think. And you want to fill the frame with as much as, as much of your subject as you can. Um, and that, of course, depends on how wide the group is. And, and, and if the group is too wide for you to fit it in there, then you scrunch everybody together, and then you get pretty close, and then you get them to make some sort of faces at you, whether it's just smiling or, or whatever, or crack people up and then shoot a couple of snaps. So I don't really want any room on the sides of the photo? No, that depends. on. But if it's a group photo like that, I would say, yeah, you want to get pretty close huh. and, and, and fill the frame as much as possible because what probably people are looking for in a shot like that is is so that you can see who it is and 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 see their expression on their faces and if if their subject is really small in the frame it might be hard to see that so 
And now, now what about the bottom of the photo? Where do I cut it off? Like at the waist, at the knees, or the feet, or higher? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, I would say in a group photo in the bar like that, I'd probably cut them off down the torso about halfway or so. Okay. All right. Sounds good. And get good. really pretty close. And, and, and then, of course, you know, shooting out in nature is a completely different thing. But if you have to have to perform on the spot in the bar, that's probably how I would do it. Right. Yeah. Sometimes <laughs> at the bar when I'm really fooling around, I'll turn the, the camera to the front-facing camera and just take a picture of myself. The good old selfie. <laughs> the good yeah. old selfie. No, I'm just kidding around. Well, thank you. Thank you for that advice. We'll probably learn a lot from you in this, uh, in this discussion. So thank you for that. So I guess... Uh, let's start off. How did you get so good at photography? What's your background? Uh, wow, that's a, that's a good question. So um, I've been shooting photographs on and off since I was a kid. Um, I used to play around with my dad's Minolta 35 millimeter um, camera when I was a little kid and sort of on and off for many years shooting photographs. But I'm actually trained as a chemist. I was in the biotech industry oh, wow. for a long time and uh, was working on cancer drugs in oncology Um and after a handful of years of doing that, I decided that, you know, I thought that this is really what I wanted to do. And then I realized what I really want to do is be out in the mountains shooting photographs for a living. And I had a few friends that had made the transition from, you know, whatever they were doing to become a professional photographers um, that I have, you know, fortunate enough to call both friends and mentors and sort of advisors as I started um, my career. So I started shooting seriously and I started uh, submitting my work and getting my work out there and getting it both critiqued and sending it out to all kinds of different places. And, uh, you know, for almost a year, I, I wasn't getting replies when I was sending out my stuff. And I was like, oh, man, man, this is really rough. Like, maybe my stuff isn't good enough or maybe people aren't watching it because nobody knows your name when you're starting out, right? It's not like, they're, oh, here's some stuff from Fred. We should take a look at it. It's like they're getting a couple of hundred emails like that a day if they're an editor at a popular place. So you really have to break through a wall there. And I think finally I did. And after a year, all of a sudden I started getting all these requests for high-res images and to buy images from me. And at that point I was like, wow, okay, maybe I really can do this. Mm -hmm. And then I kept working both jobs for another year and saved a bunch of cash from my sort of regular job. And then, uh, then I quit and just sort of threw myself into this uh, crazy world of professional photography. And that was about four and a half years ago. I had no idea that that was your background. I, I honestly, like, I, I do research for, before every uh, person that I have on this interview, and wow! You, so you came from chemistry. I thought for sure that you just had a passion for the outdoors, which you do, obviously. But then eventually things just escalated. You got to taking. I, I had no idea that you were in chemistry. The, yeah. Is there any <laughs> is there any overlap between those two professions? I would say they're very different. Okay. One is very left brain, one is very right brain. But um, yeah, no, th th there isn't that much crossover, I guess I would say. And uh, it's interesting. I I, uh, I went to grad school at the University of Utah. And so I moved out there because one, it was a good program. And two, um, I was in the Wasatch Front. So while I was in grad school, I was out skiing and climbing and trail running and mountain biking and stuff all the time. And then I was busting my tail in the, in the chemistry lab. Um, and kind of shooting photos, mostly for fun at that time, but little did I know, later on it became much more serious. But anyway, so in my life, those two have always been married. I've always tried to live in places where I could, could do, be outside and follow my passions, and then photography kind of got, got stronger and stronger, got more and more of a foothold, and I got more serious about it, and, and uh, that's sort of how it evolved. That is so cool. Were you taking pictures in the lab at all? No, I okay. never did. No, <laughs> I'm not sure if that was a stupid question or not. But oh uh, no, not at all. It. Actually, some some of that can be really interesting. Yeah, um, to sort of the the juxtaposition of some some ripping skier that then puts on the lab coat and the protective glasses and go place around <laughs> with chemicals. You I know? like it. Yeah, yeah. So, so and you also do videography now, right? Yes, that's correct. So here's here's a couple of stupid questions, but I'm just going to throw away my ego because they might actually turn out to be not stupid questions. First of all. Why are we even still taking pictures? Aren't isn't videography enough like a like a high resolution to just take still shots from the videography? Um yes and no. So it's a good question and ultimately we might get there. First of all, the way you frame up a video shot and the way you frame up a still shot is not always the same. And the way that you let the subject travel through a frame when you're shooting video video versus how you might mm. capture it in a still frame is not exactly the same. Okay. And then um, there's not that many cameras yet that can really create the kind of shutter speed uh, and frame rate that you need to really have a crisp still shot. And oftentimes, 
what flies really well as a video sequence, if you freeze that and take any still frame, almost none of those might fly as, for example, a cover image or something really strong mm. as a still image. So you have to approach it slightly differently. And then there's a, other few things that, that sort of fold into that. Um, when you're traveling to shoot stills, you can go a lot lighter with a lot less setup time. You can travel through mountains better. You can travel through technical terrain a lot better. When you're shooting, st- when you're shooting video, um, especially today with all the production values, it's, it's a big setup and you have cranes and you have sliders and you have all this different stuff that you just can't go as a one guy show with a small backpack and try to keep up with some trail runners. Mm. So it all depends on how you approach things. But, but ultimately, we may get there. Um, but I, you know, a still frame to me has a different sort of appeal than a video sequence. A video sequence can be really amazing and photogenic, if you will, and have very strong visual appeal. But there's a big storytelling component and a big timeline through that, whereas a still image is one moment in time that's that's priceless. So you know? I've always heard this one moment in time thing, and it's supposed to, you know, capture the moment. Have you seen these photos where, like, the, I don't know exactly what the terminology is, but they basically capture a large amount of time like a, a do you know what i'm talking about oh like a time lapse time lapse sure yeah i think that's it so why are we doing time lapses if photography is supposed to capture a moment in time okay so well so i think we're gonna have to back up a little bit here because i think this the still frame you might be referring to is a long shutter speed so for example when you get if you see the photographs with the big star streaks across yes, the sky exactly that's what i'm right so about. that's that's a <laughs> longer moment in time so that shutter might be open for half an hour or five minutes or, or maybe even longer, maybe two, three hours if you're shooting star, star trails in the middle of the night. And that basically is a moment in time, but you're gathering information that entire time. And if you're shooting video or a time lapse, a time lapse is basically a sequence of still photographs that you then edit together like they were a video. You know, a video mm-hmm. is basically a sequence of still photographs. But a time lapse is a little bit different because a time lapse will, can allow you to capture, for example, 12 hours or 24 hours, or in the case of, of some of the spectacular glacier stuff that's coming out, right. maybe it's yeah. years, that you can compress into a minute of viewing or less so that the viewer is like basically overwhelmed with like, wow, look at all this that's going on that you normally would not not even pick up on because it happens too slow for us to really get it. So that one I like. I like those. But what I don't understand are the ones where the stars are streaking across the sky. So in a, kind of in a technical way or, 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 or why you would shoot uh, that? I guess more in an artistic way. If the point of a photograph is to capture a moment in time, like it looks really, really nice. But if the point is to capture a moment in time, why would we build something that doesn't ever look like something we would ever see? Well, maybe. But I think what's the, the whole point with photography is to make it look visually compelling. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? To have an artistic presentation of a scene as a photographer sees it or as as someone might see it and make it compelling so when you you know i i for example really like to star treaks across desert towers or something in in the southwestern utah or southeastern utah or Mm -hmm. or something like that and then you can also let the light from the stars burn in the ground that so in other words normally you might have a black silhouetted stuff that's associated with the ground like a mountain range or or desert towers or what have you or trees or whatever but when your shutter is open that long you can have the light from the stars even give you contrast in that black silhouette and bring that to life so uh, i don't know i think it's just a different way of representing reality in a way that our brains don't really pick up on it and that's what's cool about that same thing with time lapses where you really take you know hours or days worth of events and compress it into 30 seconds um in our compressed world and basically show it off as like, wow, look what happens when you're, you're not really, your brain is, is not fast enough to pick up on this. I like the way you put that with the brain and maybe it's something that our brains don't initially see, but if we're a little bit more open-minded with how things progress and condensing it down to one image, I like it. And I should say that there is a lot more knowledge and experience behind your opinion on this. So I think I might, in fact, just change my opinion and (laughs) go with you. Uh, You you alluded to this a little bit earlier uh, about video versus uh, photography and how you have to move uh, much faster or you can move much faster as a photographer. Why is that very important, and wh- what's your day like, I guess, when you sh- go out for a shoot? What, what are, how far are you traveling? Where are you going? 
That can really depend. So it, it can be anything from, um, you know, five minutes from a trailhead, for example. Let's, so let's just keep this in the sort of the adventure space. Yeah. So it could be like five minutes from a trailhead and you could be out there with an art director and stylist and you have strobes and you have all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Or you could be out with two amazingly strong athletes and be hours into the backcountry shooting on some remote ridgeline or, or something like that. So, um, but I, I would say I specialize in the second, uh, basically traveling into the mountains and, and sort of trying to be a part of the athlete team, whether you're out there as a rock climbing group or as a, doing a rock climbing shoot or you're doing a trail running shoot or, or, or even video, even though that, that does change things a little bit. But so if we keep it in the stills world, that I would say around here, that means to get up, um, maybe I get up at three o'clock in the morning spend two hours running or skiing or whatever, doing the approach to the location we want to be at so that we can capture the first light as the sun just rises and we're in position and we're have our stuff framed up and we know what we want to do or we know what rock climb we want to shoot and we know that that catches first light and so the light's going to be the best at that time for the most dramatic images and, and, and you sort of time it that way. And then it's a couple hours to get back to the trailhead. And so it's usually a kind of a full day full body experience. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, so that's, that's sort of what I really like to do. Um, and then, but it it really does vary a lot. It sounds like a lot of fun to just kind of be waiting for the sun to rise at five o'clock in the morning. It it, it is. It's always painful, you know, when the alarm goes off and you've only slept a couple of hours, but Mm -hmm. once you get a cup of coffee down and and you're heading out the door and, you know, being above tree line, um, before the sun rises is, is, is pretty amazing. And then, and then just, you know, you just can't you just can't beat it. Being up high when the sun rises or sets is is magic. So what um, if what if you don't get the shot that you want? Well, that sucks when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, it, and it happens because you can't predict weather and you can't predict what the light's going to do. But that's what really makes it exciting. Sometimes you're out and it doesn't really happen, and 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 that might mean you have to go out and try it again, especially if you know it's a high pressure shoot. And and sometimes you have to create compelling images, even though the light doesn't sort of really happen you, you still have to make make it count and that's what i think what separates a professional from a non-professional is you got to be able to go out there and get it done even mm. when it's not perfect you know you, you still got to have the tools and the tricks to sort of make that happen uh, but that's what makes it so awesome because sometimes you go out and it's just amazing you know i like this summer i was on a ridge line down in the san juans with uh, a trail runner named luke nelson who's become a good friend of mine and we were up there, and it looked like it was going to be pretty good, and it turned out to be the best sunset photo session I've ever had. Mm. It was absolutely off the hook. And it was one of those nights where you're just standing there like, wow, I can't believe this is happening. That's neat. It's it's cool. Probably not something that you really had in your chemistry career either. <laughs> <laughs> no, you could definitely say that. <laughs> I mean, the unpredictability part was certainly there. You never really knew what you were going to get. But, um, yeah, no, it's uh, – it's definitely very different, and uh, I've had a passion for being out outside my whole life. So being able to to combine the two is really awesome. Um, but also, for everybody, should be aware that once you make your passion your living, that changes things as well. Hmm. What do you mean by that? You know, it's not the same anymore. Like if I'm out shooting all day long, I'm out working, and everybody's like, "Oh, wow, you get to do all this stuff," and it's like, "Yes, I do," and and it's it's awesome, but. I'm out there working and the pressure's on and everything's got to happen. And it's not the same as you're out there for a trail run for yourself or some soul time in the mountains, as I like to call it. Like if I get to go out without a camera and just go skiing or just go for a run or just go climbing, um, because that's what I want to do. And that's, and have the time to do that. That that almost never happens anymore. And so that's just something to be aware of. Like, you, you, you know, I think a lot of people that have made their passions into their career will say that, it's awesome, but also be aware that all of a sudden your passion is your career. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So that carries consequences. And then also the people that are subjects of those photos, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, and and that's, that's really interesting because, you know, I think most people kind of start out with photographing basically their friends and their partners and their, you know, so on. And then as you grow your business, you know, now I, I work with friends and partners too, but most of the time I'm working with professional athletes for company B, C or D or whoever's part of the story or whatever. And then I've been fortunate enough to call a lot of those, those people, my friends now. Um, so, so that's another part of, of the business, but you know, you definitely want to try to surround yourself with the best athletes that you can and athletes that are interested in, in working with photographers and videographers and being in front of the camera 
instead of, you know, there's a lot of athletes that, that completely understandably want to go do their thing and not really spend a bunch of time shooting photos. And I think this relationship between the two of you is very interesting. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, we talked to Chris Noble in episode 47. We talked a little bit about how he really is careful in making sure that he doesn't push his subjects too far. But what surprised me is that maybe the bigger problem is that which you used a fantastic term for this the the kodak what sorry what was it oh kodak courage kodak yeah. courage which is when the subject is a, a little bit too confident in his or her skills have you had to deal with kodak courage yeah uh i have um and basically you know, a lot of people really are fired up to, to make it happen in front of the camera and really send it huge if you're on skis or, or whatever and, uh, or really run it out or really go for it in, in if you're shooting climbing. Or, or, but that, I mean, for me, a successful day for everybody is when we get the shot and everybody walks home at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, there's been, I've been out shooting skiing before and people have blown their knees when they're trying to send it huge and, and that's just – that's not good for anybody. I don't want to be there when that happens. I don't want to encourage that. I want people to be safe. I want people to do what they do, but not do anything more. What I always say to guys that I'm out working with and girls is don't do anything you wouldn't do if I wasn't here. Mm -hmm. Does that work though? It does. Mm -hmm. I think so. I mean, sometimes people, yeah, maybe sometimes you miss an opportunity, but if, if I got a shot of somebody and then they, they land and blow their knee or, or, or worse, then, then that's not really, that's kind of not the point. It's devastating. I mean, a lot of times the guilt that you feel when other people get injured is worse than when you get injured yourself. It, it seems very difficult. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. I, luckily, I haven't had anything worse than, 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 than a blown knee. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, no, I, I, I couldn't imagine, like, for example, with all the free soloing, like if I was oh, there shooting somebody free soloing and somebody decks. That would be that would be terrible, and I would definitely f- feel guilty about that. And uh, you know, that's that's I think you know I've only shot free soloing a few times, but that's always you know it's it's you're trying to capture an athlete doing their thing, right? So you're just trying to portray what they're doing, and they're out there pushing it and doing all this stuff. But at the same time, you're out there sort of shooting photos to try to make a living. So you know, it's 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 a, it's an interesting line. It's a fine line, I think, that that you have to thread and be comfortable with what you're doing your position in terms of if you affect what they're doing, both directly and indirectly. I think you have to be really smart about what you're doing and what you're trying to create. And sometimes you don't have to, you don't have to take life or death risks to create compelling imagery and stories. And uh, I, I think sometimes that's forgotten, but mm-hmm. um, certainly if somebody's willing to do that and that's what they're going to do anyways, and, and I'm going to go out and capture it, then that's fine. But you have to be very smart, I think, about how you approach it. Yeah. For the listeners who aren't aware of what free soloing is, if you aren't, is when you climb without ropes. Is that what we just discussed, the hardest part of photography? Or what do you think is, like, what's your biggest challenge? Wow. Um, That is a good question. I think that athlete-photographer relationships are extremely important. I I would say I, I, they've come really naturally Mm -hmm. and I've established relationships with people whom I I call my friends throughout, throughout sort of shooting photos. Um, so for me, that is, is is extremely important, but also usually comes pretty easy. The biggest challenges of photography today, I think is that you have to stand out in a sea of photographers. I mean, everybody Mm -hmm. is a photographer now. Um, and you have to market your work and you have to get a foothold in the market and you have to stay current. You have to be in there. I think in the outdoor space, you have to be athletic. You have to be fit. You have to be strong. You have to be able to go out there and do what the other guys are doing. Um, at least not be a huge burden. And so I would say those things is what I view as the challenges. Um, I think for me personally, uh, just getting through my workflow and getting my work marketed and getting my work out there to the right places um, is, and, and sort of time management, I would say is my biggest challenge at this point, but um, there's, there, it's tough, you know, it's a tough, it's a really tough market. It's really, it's saturated and uh, you have to sort of fight your way in there. And, and then, you know, I, so I sort of feel like I've done that. I fought my way in there. I've gotten myself established, but you know, it's not like the fight stops there. You got to keep 
claw on your way to make sure you don't fall back out. You know? Yeah, exactly. Low barriers to entry, right? Yeah, well, to entry, to, to just start shooting photos for sure, but really high barrier, I think, to get in there and actually call yourself a professional yes, in the sense that point. you're actually making a living doing it. Mm-hmm, good point. I, I have some random questions that I wanted to ask you just really quickly. First of all, how many cameras do you have? Uh, I have currently four. Four cameras. What is your most expensive camera? Uh, it's probably about 4,000 bucks. In one shoot, what is the most number of photos that you have taken? Wow, a lot. Um, okay, so I usually go out, so if I'm shooting a day, that'll probably be about 1,000 frames or so. Wow, okay. <laughs> but I'm also, you gotta, so I also shoot a lot of action, which means you're basically, you have your shot that you want, and basically when, when, when that action is happening, you you press the button and you let the camera fire off 20 uh-huh. frames in that instant. So, so it ends up being a lot of frames, and and if you and sometimes you go out and you shoot like maybe 150 frames, and you kill it because it's an easy shot to grab, if you will, in terms of technically easy shot to grab. So, so it really depends. But I just, for example, I just I was just in in Sweden, and we uh, did a trail running project up there, and we ran the King's Trail in Arctic Sweden. We were out for seven days, and I think I shot like 5,000 frames. Wow, five. 000. So if you break down the number of seconds in a day divided by how many seconds are in a day i want to do this math really wow, quickly. That's, that's a good question <laughs> so we have 60 seconds in a minute 60 minutes in an hour so 60 times 60 3600 times we'll call it 12 so basically half of the day if you spend the other half not shooting so 3600 times 12 is 43,200 divided by a thousand if you take a thousand photos in a day you average one picture every 43 seconds throughout your entire day fred that's pretty crazy that's actually. pretty impressive <laughs> nice work well i think basically when you get to a spot and that you want to shoot you work it yeah yeah you just you get everything that you can good point well, i never lo- lo- looked at it that way before, and then that's pretty insane and then filtering through all of those photos oh my god yeah that's usually pretty quick actually it is it's really, I usually, I would say for me at least, it's pretty easy to throw out the stuff that you're like, eh, and then the ones you're really psyched on, and then and then it gets harder from there. Then it starts to go, okay. Uh, let's move on to your gear recommendation, Fred. We like to uh, ask all of our meisters for a gear recommendation. This can be related to photography, if you'd like, or to your passion for the outdoors, because you're obviously out there a lot. Give our listeners a gear recommendation. Okay, I would say if you're shooting photos... Um, and you're trying to move through terrain, um, I would say bring only what you know you're going to need mm-hmm. and not a bunch of extra stuff. Camera-wise, um, camera bags can be a tough one, but um, I'm really fortunate. I have a relationship with a company called Click Elite uh, who make uh, technical camera packs. So it's not just a bag that you put your cameras in, but it's a bag that you can put your, your gear in, mm-hmm. your rope, your your stuff that you need for a day in the mountains, and it has a dedicated protected camera compartment, and it's a real backpack. It's a tactical backpack. So I have a model from them called the Contradure 40. Um, I found that to be, I find that to be a really good camera pack for sort of bigger days in the mountains. Um, and they also make these little neoprene wraps, which are super sweet to throw. Like, if, for example, if you're going for a run or something really fast, you throw, bring one body, two lenses, you put them in neoprene wraps and throw them in a running pack and go. So, I, I mean, I take everything from a full setup of strobes to just like one body and two lenses and call it good. Very good. For the listeners, check out Click Elite on our website, mtnmeister.com, under Fred's Meister profile page. Those sound neat. Fred, to wrap things up, like I said, I have a lot to learn. The listeners have a lot to learn. I want to walk away with some like quick and dirty photography tips that we can take home with us. So I guess... Do with this whatever you would like. <laughs> okay, I would say um, be outside shooting photos when the light is good. That's at sunrise and sunset. Look up the rule of thirds. It's mm-hmm. a very simple way to approach composition of photographs. Very powerful, very simple. And finally, go out and shoot photos. You know, go shoot a bunch of photos, preferably all manual. Get a DSLR, shoot all manual. Or even the point and shoots nowadays are getting good. Shoot all manual. Um, and the photos will get there. Love it. Fred Marmsader, thank you so much for joining us today. For the listeners, 
check out some of Fred's ridiculously amazing photos, visit Frederick, F-R-E-D-R-I-K, Marmsater, M-A-R-M-S-A-T-E-R.com. We will also have highlights of today's episode of Fred's Meister profile page on our website, mtnmeister.com. Fred, it's been awesome having you. Thanks, Ben. Really appreciate it. Hey, Meister fans. Thanks for listening to today's episode. Hope you got some good tips that you can work into your own photography. It's very easy to share photos nowadays. Might as well make them good photos, right? Mountain Meister is a great way to learn about these little nifty things in the outdoors world or the adventure world. Today, we learned about photography. We've learned about how skis are manufactured. We've even talked about acclimatization and how that process works. If you have an idea for a topic that you'd like to hear explored on this show, send us a note. If we like it, we'll go out, find an expert on the topic, make an episode of Mountain Meister, and voila, you will have just become that much more knowledgeable. You have been listening to Mountain Meister, and I am your host, 